This is a $1,000 card that I found and bought off of Facebook Marketplace with plans to transform it and sell it off for more. Hello and welcome, my name is Kevin, and if y'all are new here, welcome to my channel where I like to buy cheap cars and modify them on a budget. So in today's episode, I'll be showing you guys exactly what I did to make this car go from this to this. It all started on the night that I was just scrolling through Facebook Marketplace, as I usually do, and saw a listing for this beat up looking RSX. The guy had it posted up for like $1,500 and with a price like that, of course I had to click and see what's up. Yeah, this might be a pretty bad financial decision, but yeah, I think I'm gonna pick this up. In the description, it was being advertised as a car that runs and drives, but also needs a tune-up. First, I was pretty skeptical because of how low his asking price was, especially for a running and driving RSX with a standard transmission. To me, it sounded too good to be true because you never see these things being sold for under 3k. But as an experienced shitbox collector, I had a gut feeling that this one was legit. So I did what any other car guy would have done. Lowball the shit out of him. I'm just playing y'all. I simply gave him a quick message saying that I was super duper interested in taking it off his hands. And after chatting with him for a bit, we finally decided to meet up at a location and make the transaction. driving so rough right now let me put on my seatbelt but yeah he was telling me it won't go past 3k yeah so I've had my fair share of sketchy situations where I'm driving home from a Facebook market deal and you just never know what's gonna go wrong and in this case the car was running in lit mode and it died on me like three times during the drive home all right man ah oh, that shit died on me but nonetheless we got it home safely and now we have a new project on our hands but yeah let me go ahead and give y'all a walk around at a first glance, this thing is definitely a fixer-upper, but with some time and some elbow grease and a little bit of loving, I'm definitely thinking we could flip this for some profit. I think for a thousand bucks, it's not that bad. Like, for a thousand bucks, I'd say it's for a steal. So as we take a look underneath the hood, it looks like we're working with a K20 A3 motor that was actually pulled from a junkyard and installed into this car by the previous owner. And upon further inspection, I actually noticed that one of the wires was ripped off from the coil plug which is one of the reasons why the engine was running so bad. I ended up having to re-solder it back together and wrapped it up nicely with some electrical tape just as a really quick fix. Alright, so first things first, we scanned the car for codes and I was pulling up a code for P1166, which meant there was something up with our O2 sensor. Alright, John, take a look at this. Alright, so this is why the car is throwing a uh, oxygen sensor code. So if we take a look underneath the car, we see both of our O2 sensors, specifically the upstream. This thing just jiggles everywhere. Yeah, I don't think it's supposed to do that. Ah, oh, get me the f*** out of here. And so while I was waiting for that part to come into the mail, I went ahead and tackled another part of the maintenance, which was the idle air control valve. All I did was take it out and spray some brake cleaner inside of it to clean out all of that gunk that was built up. Gotta figure something out for the hood, because look at this. I don't want this flying up on me while I'm driving, so I'm thinking about hood latches. Alright, looks like our O2 sensor finally showed up. So the one that I needed to replace was the upstream O2 sensor. And this tiny little part cost me 160 bucks. Yeah, I was not happy about that price. But in the end, I swallowed my pride and emptied out my wallet. Because this was definitely a part that I needed in order to get this car running properly. And right here, we'll just do a little comparison. Out with the old and in with the new. So on a cold start, it sounds really weird when it starts up. This shit sounds like it's gonna blow up. What the hell? I'm not too sure why, but um, we'll see if it does it here. Okay, the check engine light just came back on. Busted out the OBD scanner once again, and it looks like it's pulling up a code for P0336. Now luckily for me, this is just another sensor that we've got to replace, and this was ultimately the reason why the RSX was running in limp mode. So it looks like we got another package in the mail, and let's go ahead and see what's inside. Looks like we've got our sensor, some NGK spark plugs, and look at that, a rock auto magnet. 
Does anyone else love collecting those, or is it just me? So before we install that crankshaft position sensor, I'm gonna go ahead and tackle these spark plugs real quick. It never hurts to do a quick little tune-up, so I went ahead and ordered some NGK spark plugs for this junkyard engine. Check it out, compare the old one to this brand new one that we're about to install. And after finishing up with the spark plugs, it's on to the main issue, that darn crankshaft position sensor. Almost forgot to mention the total cost of the spark plugs plus this sensor, it cost me another 160 bucks. <laughs> but if that's what it takes to get this thing up and running, then so be it. And so this sensor is pretty easy to replace, all you gotta do is take off the wheel and it's right there in your face. Now as you can see, it's pretty dirty under here, and I think the reason why this plug is failing is because the car actually has a power steering leak, and that reservoir is like literally right above it, so all of that excess sludge and all that gunk is just sloshing all over down here. And actually that power steering leak is affecting a lot of the components down here. For example, the alternator, which is why the battery light's on. So yeah, there's a lot of things wrong with this car, but more importantly, I wanted to get this sensor in so that the car is no longer in limp mode. Yo, I think it worked. It's not in limp mode anymore, so I think I think we did it right there. So now that we have this thing properly running, I'm gonna go ahead and work on that on the body now. Yeah, so we're finally gonna get to work on the body, which is the funnest part of the job. First thing we'll do is install these hood latches that we got in the mill. These are just some cheap ones that I found on Amazon that looks like it'll do the job. These are pretty simple to install as long as you're not afraid to cut into your hood. As you can see here, I made a little template to make sure I do this correctly. For this type of job, you're gonna have to cut twice, which is the first layer on top and then the second layer underneath. And I just used a simple rotary tool to cut into my hood. Just slip this right in. There we go, we got both holes cut, and all I gotta do now is install the hardware. And now that we've got the hood latches in, we've gotta do something about this monstrosity right here. It looks like the bumper wasn't aligning properly, so the previous owner decided to screw it all in, so that the bumper doesn't fly off. Look at this, they even screwed in the license plate. But yeah, we're just gonna get rid of this thing and find a new one. So it's time to go to my favorite place ever. The junkyard. Lucky for us, I managed to find a couple of RSXs here at the yard, starting with this one right here. It didn't have the front bumper that we wanted, and it was pretty trashed on the inside, but luckily, what it did have was a door handle that I actually needed for my car. Thankfully, someone did half of the job already, so all I had to do was unbolt it and yank that thing right out. Woo! Got ourselves a door handle, and this cost us probably around like 10 bucks. See right here, you can see the latch is broken off. Coming back to the same exact yard, we found this white RSX that was actually in one whole piece last time I saw it. But it looks like someone came through and ravaged it all. Came to pick apart this RSX. Now, as you guys know from my other series, I am working on a junkyard Civic build and once I saw these seats, I thought these would be perfect inside of the car. But of course in the end, I ended up going with the Prelude seats. But I took these anyway, because why not? I am a little mad that I didn't take the steering wheel though. But anyways, let's go ahead and load up these seats and load up this front bumper. <laughs> now this front bumper is pretty scratched up as well, but at least it doesn't have any holes from being screwed into, like the one that's on the car right now. Real quick, I'm just gonna throw this on to make sure it fits properly. And sure enough, it fits like a glove. Now we can finally move on to sanding. First off, I'm just going to take off anything and everything that I don't want to get paint on and accidentally scratch while I'm sanding. So I'm going to start by taking off the front headlights and then move to the back and take off the rear taillights. 
When you're doing a paint job yourself, it's best to take off the headlights and taillights so that you can get every nook and cranny while you're spraying the car, and so that you're not wasting time and material to mask it all off. And you also want to take off parts like the spoiler so that it's not in the way while you're spraying down the entire car. Car parts such as the spoiler, front lip, side mirrors, and the door handles, and even the side skirts, those things they'll just have to be spray painted separately. Now that we have a majority of the things that we want off of the car, let's go ahead and sand the entire thing down with some 220 grit sandpaper and get all of the blemishes out. You just want to make sure everything's nice and smooth and all of the cracks in the paint are all gone. Otherwise, it'll show up in the final spray paint. Prepping the carb for paint is by far the most important and most time consuming portion of the job. I was really out here for like all day for multiple days doing this. Mainly because the car had a lot of scratches and dents that I had to go over. But trust me, if you do a really good job on the prepping, your future self will definitely thank you for that. Alright y'all, so I'm gonna go ahead and get to the body filler portion of the paint job. So like I said before, I had a lot of dents that I had to fill in. To be honest, looking back at it now, I should have figured out how to pull the dent out instead of filling them in with Bondo. But I wanted to try this method out first just to see how well I could blend it in. But yeah, next time I'm definitely going to try pulling it out instead of using Bondo. But yeah, right here, I kind of just laid it on pretty thick. That way I could just shave down as much as I needed to. Yeah, and as you can see here, you just want to blend it in as nicely as possible. Make sure it's all smooth. And so we're finally done with the sanding portion. Let's go ahead and mask off the inside so we don't get paint in our lovely black interior. To be honest, masking the entire car off kind of takes a while as well. Especially when you're doing this outside, you're constantly having to deal with the wind blowing everything away. Now for the windows, I went ahead and used some masking paper and then just taped off the edges with some masking tape. I kind of masked this off awkwardly because I didn't realize I could take off a lot of the rubber trims from the door seal. In the end, we were able to mask everything off but I'm still a noob at this so I'm learning as I go. And as you can see, I do have the door open and that's because I am going to spray paint the door gems as well. And take a look at that guys, we've got every single thing masked off and we're now ready to paint. Alright, alright y'all, I pretty much got everything set up, ready for me to spray. All I gotta do now is just wipe it down with some cheesecloth. Using this type of cloth really helps because it takes off all of the extra dirt and grind that's left on the car. And you can find these at stores like Home Depot or Harbor Freight. Here's the paint materials I'll be using. The primer is just a one to one mixing ratio, so let's get to mixing and start spraying. Alright, so I don't know if y'all could tell, but it was pretty windy this day. Still, I somehow managed to get this done. But yeah, usually you don't want to do this when it's really windy because the overspray tends to get everywhere. And it just messes up your spray pattern. And another issue with painting outside is that if it's really sunny and really windy, it can really affect the way the paint lays onto the car. Because with those conditions, it would cause the paint to dry quickly. I tend to have that issue primarily when spraying primer. But at the end of the day, that doesn't really matter because all of it gets wet sanded at the end. But yeah, for this first layer, I'm just laying it on there really lightly. Alright, so we got one layer of primer sprayed down. General rule of thumb when painting, you want to spray the first coat lightly, and then the coats after that, you can spray as heavy as you want to blend the coats in nicely. I've only got a gallon of paint to work with, but that's plenty enough to spray down an entire car. But yeah, I just really wanted to get these layers in thick, so that the paint could adhere to it really good, and also so there's less of a chance of the paint job chipping. And as you can see right here, we've got the entire car laid down. I believe I did three coats. And once it all dries completely, we're going to go ahead and hit it with some 400 grit sandpaper and wet sand it until it's nice and even. What? Oh my god, don't tell me it's going to rain. It is a bit cloudy out here. Yeah, I'm gonna check the weather real quick. <laughs> Alright, I don't even care. 
this is my only day off, so I'm just gonna go at it. All right, guys, it's finally time for the base coat. What we've got here is just a basic white. It's the most affordable and the easiest to spray. So this color choice is perfect for an amateur like myself. And by the way, this right here, guys, I didn't have my gun set up properly for this fender. I got way too much liquid shooting out the gun and not enough air. But right after I adjusted it, and as you can see here, I'm spraying a lot more lighter. Yeah, same case as the primer. Spray it lightly for the first coat, and then spray it heavy on the next. Now, if you're doing this outside like I am, best weather conditions you want to be looking for is a cloudy day and no wind. If you're doing it on a really sunny day, you'll have more of a chance of tiger striping your paint job. And if you're worried about bugs or dirt flying into the paint job, just don't even try doing this outside because those are a given. And the way to deal with that is you just spray right over it. All right, guys, it's starting to rain. Luckily, I mean, I kind of got the whole car, but damn it, it's freaking sprinkling now. Oh my goodness, okay. I guess I'll try to cover up the car, I don't know. It's like, how does rain affect a paint job that's in the process? I mean, I got two coats all around, but it's definitely not enough. Luckily for me, it only sprinkled for a little bit and stopped soon after. So I went ahead and sprayed that third and final coat that the car really needed and got my paint gun ready to spray the clear. Here's the material I'm working with. You got clear and the activator. And we're just gonna get these coats on real quickly because I definitely don't want it to rain down on me while I'm doing this again. But yeah guys, for the clear coat, I'm laying it down real thick so it has a nice glossy finish. I think I only had enough material for two coats, but I definitely recommend three or four just for that nice smooth finish. Honestly, if you're doing a paint job outside, the more layers that you spray, the better your paint job will turn out. Yo, I'm finally done. I don't know if y'all can see the little shine in the camera. Ooh. I wish I could have gotten one more coat in, but uh, I think I'm running out of activator. Woo, check me out y'all, it don't look too bad. We finally got the car all one color and it's got a decent shine to it. For about 500 bucks and doing this outside, I'd say we did a damn good job. And here I am spraying the rest of the parts for the car. I just got it suspended from the ceiling so I got hit every corner and every angle. And guys, I know what you're thinking. I have a freaking carport in my driveway. Why didn't I spray the car underneath this? I would have loved to, but due to some factors, I just found it easier to do it in my front yard instead. Maybe in the future we'll do the next paint job in here and get better results. But yeah, let's get these parts on and see how the car looks. Oh, and by the way guys, I got this front lip off of Facebook Market. Cool little pickup for 40 bucks. Alright guys, so after a couple of days for the paint to cure, here's what the car looks like outside in the sun. For being an outside paint job, it really has a nice shine to it, and I just think it looks way better than before. And then with a the buff and a polish, it would look even way better, but we're just gonna leave it as is for now. Let me know what y'all think about it in the comments down below. As for money invested, I think I spent about a thousand bucks on this thing, so in total this was about a two thousand dollar project, which I ended up selling for double the amount, so it ended up being a nice bonus paycheck in my pockets. And if you guys are looking to do something similar to this, I'd say dedicate an entire week of just work and you should be able to as well. Like always, I appreciate y'all watching and I'll see y'all for the next one.